wants to say, Dayatam sulatam pangor mamma manda matirgati matsarvasya padam bojo radha magana mohano divya rinda kalpa druma singhasana Sri Sri Radha Singhasana Sto Sri Sri Radha Govinda Devo Pristali Be Savior Mano Smarami Sri Mad Rasa Dasalam Be Vamsi Vata Tatastitaha Karsan Venu Kanar Gopir Gopinata Taistunaha Tapta Kanchana Gaurangi Radhe Vrindavaneswati Vrishabhanu Suti Devi, Pranamami Hari Priye, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hmm. <coughs> so I was going to speak on a topic called The Unfinished Business of the ISKCON Society. <laughs> a little controversial. <laughs> but we like that things because it stimulates. And it's not, actually it's not controversial because it's very much in line with Srila Prabhupada's instructions. Um, when Srila Prabhupada started the movement, before he actually came to America in 1949, he wrote a treatise which was entitled The Gita Nagari Concept. <laughs> and that Gita Nagari Concept uh, actually reached uh, the Prime Minister of, not the Prime Minister, Deputy Prime Minister of India at that time. Uh, what was his name? Sadar, Mr. Sadar. Uh, in that concept, Prabhupada studied to some degree, Gandhi's movement of how Gandhi wanted to organize the Indian society. And Gandhi's idea was four parts. <laughs> and Srila Prabhupada patterned his whole Krishna conscious society pretty much based on these four parts that he expanded into seven when he was beginning his movement in 1966 in New York City where he uh, initiated or mentioned the seven principles by which ISKCON should govern. Gandhi's thing was holy prayers, uh, holy names. Holy, holy, holy prayer, holy names, holy books. Observing Gandhi's personal life, he saw that even though he was involved with the many political aspects of his life, he always had time for his prayers. And wherever he was in the world, he would usually visit the local temples. So Gandhi was, although he was very much engaged in political he was very much on a personal level worshiping the Supreme Lord. Mostly he worshiped Lord Ram, but he also enunciated principles of the Bhagavad Gita. So Prabhupada saw that he always took time for his prayer. In other words, his, we might say his sadhana. And also, uh, he would regularly read the Bhagavad Gita. <laughs> So that was one of the principles that Srila Prabhupada adopted at the very beginning of the movement was to spread the glories of Krishna consciousness through books and through the Harinam Sankirtan movement. So Prabhupada took that idea, or at least patterned his idea according to Lord Chaitanya's movement, of course, but he saw how Gandhi was also on a personal level, although involved with many political activities, still had time for his prayer, still had time for reading the Shastras. The second thing that he noticed in Gandhi's life when Gandhi would always go to the local temples wherever he was. So Prabhupada also saw, and of course, Prabhupada writes in that treatise that 
that the temples in India had really gravid down, gravitated down to a very low level of, of activity. And many of the important temples, not the important ones, but many temples in India were dens of dancing demons, as Prabhupada writes <laughs> in the in the treatise, in his Kitanagari treatise. You can read it, it's quite long, there's two parts to it. There's about, I don't know, 40 pages. But it's interesting, and Prabhupada mentions how many groups were coming into the temples and doing their own tantric worship and various types of uh, rituals. And the temples were more or less uh, run by people who were using the temples to uh, to make money, to make money, to finance their own personal needs, something like that. So, uh, Prabhupada saw that the temple worship, at least in many places in India, not everywhere, had gravitated, gravitated down to such a low level. So another thing that Prabhupada enunci enunciated in his movement was to open temples around the world. So, first thing was, where Prabhupada started off with holy names, the Sankirtan movement. Then he was writing books, printing books, and then of course distributing books. Gradually as money came in, temples were opening all over the world. And of course, even from the very beginning, another part of Gandhi's movement was to elevate people from the lower class of life who were known as chamaras or bungis. They were considered to be outcasts, people below the Vedic culture, people below the Van Ashram system. But Gandhi's idea was to rubber stamp people uh, as Harija. <laughs> In other words, just because they are, you know, a spirit soul, it's because they are, you know, uh, born in the, the Indian culture, they should be given complete rights as everyone else. Prabhupada took issue with that. He said, that's a very nice idea, but first you need education. So Prabhupada's idea was to train devotees in the philosophy and the practice of bhakti, and then qualify them to come to the point of taking initiation. <laughs> so that was another very big part. So Prabhupada took that idea from Gandhi. He said, yes, we want to make everyone Hari John, but you can't simply do that simply by rubber stamping it or by allowing people to, in a very, what we say, secular way, to have equal rights. You need to give education. You need to elevate people through the process of knowledge based on scripture, based on modern principles that govern civility and morality. And so Prabhupada's whole idea was to bring people in and to engage them in devotional service, at the same time educate them in the science of bhakti through Srimad Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita, nectar devotion, and ultimately Chaitanya Charitamrita. Of course, at those days, that was teachings of Lord Chaitanya, one volume set. The Prabhupada emphasized these four books for education. And he said these four books contain all the knowledge that one is needed to become fully Krishna conscious and qualify themselves to return to the spiritual world. So, but the last part of Gandhi's four-part thing, which Prabhupada also patterned pattern, pattern of, Gandhi wanted to make the villages self-sufficient. He wanted to develop village life where people would, could, could get everything they needed in livelihood in the villages. And uh, so he, he made an effort in that direction. Of course, he didn't get much support. And then he was, he was all, uh, killed at a certain point where he wasn't able to develop that. But Prabhupada also mentions mm, towards the end, and also during the time when Prabhupada was here, the importance of a more simplified life. And if you study the six, the seven principles that govern the activities this come, number six, is to bring the members of the society together in a more simplified lifestyle. And uh, this is illustrated by one verse, which I'll read here from the Srimad Bhagavatam verse. 
So this verse is um, This verse is from the first canto, eighth chapter, verse number forty. Imam jana pada sreda supaka supakwaksari viruda vanadri nadu danvanto ye dante tamaviksitai. This is spoken by Queen Kunti. This chapter is titled "The Prayers by Queen Kunti." This is toward the end of her prayers, glorifying the Lord. And here she says, translation, all these cities and villages are flourishing in all respects because the herbs and grains are in abundance. The trees are full of fruit, the rivers are flowing, the hills are full of minerals and the oceans full of wealth. And this is all due to your glancing over them. <laughs> so in this way she's praising Krishna, but she's also mentioning how the earth is, is providing everything that everyone needs simply by her, you know, natural gifts to the human society. Now, Prabhupada's purport is quite, uh, what we say, condemning, and at the same time, pointing towards what is the ideal. And he says, human prosperity flourishes by natural gifts and not by gigantic industrial enterprises. The in that gigantic industrial enterprises are products of a godless civilization, and they cause the destruction of the noble aims of human life. The more we go on in increasing such troublesome industries to squeeze out the vital energy of the human being, the more there will be unrest and dissatisfaction of the people in general. Although a few only can live lavishly, by exploitation. The natural gifts such as grains, vegetables, fruit, rivers, the hills of jewels and minerals, and the seas full of pearls are supplied by the order of the Supreme. And as he desires, material nature produces them in abundance or restricts them at times. The natural law is that the human being may take advantage of these godly gifts by nature and satisfactorily flourish on them without being captivated by the exploit motive of lording it over the material nature. The more we attempt to exploit material nature according to our whims of enjoyment, the more we shall become entrapped by the reactions of self-exploitative attempts. If we have sufficient grains, fruit, vegetables, and herbs, then what is the necessary of running slaughterhouses in killing all animals. A man need not kill an animal if he has sufficient grains and vegetables to eat. The flow of river waters fertilizes the fields and there's more than what we need. Minerals are produced in the hills and jewels in the ocean. If the human society, civilization has sufficient grains, minerals, jewels, water, milk, etc., then why should we hanker after terrible industrial enterprises at the cost of the labor of some unfortunate men? But all these natural gifts are dependent on the mercy of the Lord. What we need, therefore, is to be obedient to the laws of the Lord and achieve the perfection of human life by devotional service. The indication of Kunti Devi are just to the point. She desires that God's mercy be bestowed upon them so that natural prosperity be maintained by His grace. Mm -hmm. So here in this particular purport, we see that there are two points that are being made. What is the present Western civilization and how it is destroying the good qualities of the human life beings with unnecessary developments of industrial and very technological complexes which are destroying both the earth and the individuals on the earth. And going back to a more civilized and more simplified lifestyle which is dependent on the mercy of the Lord coming through the, the natural gifts that, that nature gives. And Prabhupada says, you know, 
He goes on in other places, fruits, flowers, hills full of minerals, milk, uh, grains, vegetables, cotton, all of the things that are necessary for livelihood for the human being. Um, in 19, I'm sorry, in 1850, there was a there was a statistic taken, and then of course the statistic was done again in uh, just recently, within the last 30 years, that in the year 1850, around that time. 95% of the things that were available to the human civilization on the local markets, that means within the society, were considered to be necessities. They were required. And 5% were considered to be luxuries or extras. And the recent statistic has, has switched the, uh, has switched the, uh, statistics completely around where 95% of the things that are on the market today are considered useless and not needed. <laughs> there are many white like categories that categorize them as luxuries, but in another sense, they're just exploitation of the earth for some economic gain by a, a small group of people. And 5%, so what, do, what, does, what does the human being need in terms of livelihood. Well, we need food, obviously. Clothes, obviously. Some shelter, place to live, obviously. Education and the facilities for medical care. And uh, basically that is the essence of the, and this, all of this is provided automatically by nature. In the fourth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, it describes how there was a particular king who came to rule because he was the son of another king who gave up his rule and went to the forest because he was somewhat frustrated with his progeny, and that was King Admitra, and his son was King Vena. King Vena, although because he, he was in line of his father, took the throne, but he wasn't qualified to be a king. He was avaricious and he was somewhat atheistic also. Took the rule of society and stopped all Vedic sacrifices and was um, uh, exploiting his position in order to gain personal power and, and accumulate as much as he could. The Brahmins at that time really were quite disturbed by this king and made petitions to try to change him, but he refused. He said, I am the Supreme Lord, you have to follow me. <laughs> he was quite, um, what we say, intoxicated with this idea that he was the, the most important person in existence. And so the Brahmins, they still had Br 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 Brahmin Tejas. They were still quite powerful. So they got together and they performed a sacrifice to kill the king. <laughs> and it was successful. And by their mantras, they killed him. Because when Brahmins chant mantras pure or purely, they, they, that can activate the whole material energy to work in a certain way. Mantras powerful. That's why when we chant the Hare Krishna mantra, uh, when we chant it purely, we can feel very strongly the presence of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And my, all mantras that are in the Vedas have a particular purpose, purpose to bring about spiritual elevation or even material um, gain when mantras are chanted properly. So these Brahmins were so proficient at chanting these mantras, they killed the king. Then it describes that now there was no ruler. So they, as it's explained in the, in his, that they churned his body, and from his body came two particular personalities. The first one was called Bahuka. He was a low-class man, and he was sent to a, an area of the world to live. And after that, that was the impure aspect of the body of the king. And after that came another personality called Prithu Maharaj. 
And Bhikkhu Maharaj was actually a Shaktivesh avatar that had come to take over the rule of the earth at the time. And when he did, he, after taking the position and ruling for some time, he saw that the earth was not providing the natural gifts that Chior normally provides. And that was because of the rule of King Vena. Everything had gone bad. So it's explained that when the leadership in the world is demoniac or exploited, exploitative, then, with, then nature withholds her bounty, as Prabhupada says here. And what does he say? He says that here. It says here, yeah, the natural gifts such as grains, vegetables, fruit, rivers, the hills full of jewels and minerals, and seas full of pearls are supplied by the order of the Supreme. And as he desires, material nature produces them in abundance or restricts them at times. So material nature is both the punisher and the, and the provider for the living beings. And God uses material nature to give what we need or to punish and restrict when people are becoming too sinful, especially the leadership in the world. So, of course, then when Prithu Maharaj saw the situation, he summoned the earth, she came forward. There was a great sacrifice performed. And then again, gradually, because of his pious rule, the earth started to again provide everything that everyone needs. So Srila Prabhupada, and towards the end, and also not even towards the end, in 1974, Prabhupada said we have to we have to establish this Vanashram Dharma, Daivi Vanashram, which Prabhupada means that we should train devotees to become Brahminical. We should also train, set up an education system to evaluate others and see what are their propensities based on education and activity. And through an evaluation system, also find those who have the propensity for Kshatriya and those who have the propensity for Vaishya. Because Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Chaturvarni and Manastra Sanguna Karma Vipada Saha. According to uh, the, these four classes of men, Brahmins, Shatras, Aishas, or Sudras, they are produced by me. So all, all the population has these qualities, more or less in the dormant stage. And through education and activity, one can understand what is the nature and propensity of a particular living entity. Because in this age, Kolo Sudra Sambhavan, people are born uh, basically as sutras. Therefore, Prabhupada said, set up these educational colleges, he called them Vanashram College. Educate and create a class of Brahmins who will be the teachers for the rest of the Varnas. And then train and engage people according to their propensities. And then that way we. People will work accordingly, and then that will be the social system based on engaging those qualities and propensities in the service of the Supreme Lord devotional service. So Prabhupada called it Daivi Vanashram, <laughs> spiritual Vanashram, not just Vana and Ashram in a material sense. And then Prabhupada said, this can only be done in our, in farm, in our farm communities. So he said, establish these these farms, these more simplified ways of living, go back to a more simplified lifestyle where we can grow our own food, keep cows, um, practice Van Ashram, and live a more simplified life where people, devotees, can chant the holy names in an atmosphere free from all of the encumbrances that come by way of living in this highly technological industrial society which pressurizes people to work in occupations that are really not conducive to their livelihood 
but it provides some capital. Some people are forced to accept that. So Prabhupada wanted us to gradually withdraw from society and more or less create our own society within the society. And he said this is done by a more rural type of lifestyle. And then Prabhupada outlined that in hundreds, I mean literally hundreds. I just did a book, unfortunately, when I was trying to rush to get to the airplane on the day that I was supposed to come here. I had the book all ready to come. It was called Krishna's Way of Natural Living. But I ran out the door and I forgot the books. <laughs> so I'm sorry I wasn't able to bring the book. But the book is based on Srila Prabhupada's vision for the future of our society, a more simplified lifestyle. And he said, every city temple should have a farm community connected with that city temple, which will provide everything we need for livelihood. And he said, you know, grow vegetables. He said, the vegetables that you grow on, on our farms will be a hundred times more nutritious than what you buy in the stores. Because you find today people are getting sick simply by eating because the foods are saturated with pesticides and various types of chemicals. And this is proven. If you milk a cow and you take that milk and you put it into a refrigerator, and if you go to the store and you buy commercial milk and put it in the refrigerator, commercial milk will last two or three weeks because it's full of chemicals. <laughs> Whereas the milk from the cow will not last that long because it's natural milk and it has to be used within a certain period of time. So, yeah, this is one of the points that Srila Prabhupada made, grow your own food. He said that starting with agriculture, that is the basis for developing these communities. Once you can feed all of the devotees, both in the farm communities and in the temples, and he said, then you'll have an abundance, and then you can open up restaurants in the cities and invite people to come and give them very first class prasadam. And these problems, and then they will never go back, go back to their old way of eating anymore. So yeah, so this was one Prabhupada's uh, idea. He wanted the city temples to continue, but he also wanted us to develop these farm communities. And he said the farm communities are for the grihastas mostly. He said the brahmacharis and the sannyasis, they're more mobile. They can go from place to place, but grihastas need to stabilize their lifestyle. They usually require a stable environment where they can get their livelihood, they can get education for their children. They can get a, They can also provide for their worship, of course. So Prabhupada said the, far, the farms will be ideal for developing the Grihastha life. And then we can develop these and keep cows, he said. And Prabhupada talked a lot about the importance of, you know, keeping cows and the benefit of a cow from both the material and spiritual perspective, the cow provides so much for the living entity. Spiritually, we use her ingredients in worship. And just like when we do Abhishek, you know, there's this thing called Pancha Gavya. <laughs> Gavya refers to the cow. So what is that Pancha? Pancha means five. Five substances, milk, yogurt, ghee, cow dung, and cow urine. We place cow dung and cow urine on the deity. <laughs> so the stool of an animal is used to bathe the deity. So what, what does that say? That that animal is actually very, very sacred, very, very pure. If we can actually, and that's according to Vedic, you know, injunctions that we, these things are so pure that they, be, they can be used in our worship. And uh, you take cow dung, you dry it out. Of course, those of you who live in India, you know that they dry it, they mix it with patty, slap it on the side of the, the house, it dries out, and then you cook. <laughs> when I first joined the Hare Krishna movement, I, I joined in New Vrindavan, West Virginia, 
and it was a farm community, and uh, we cooked with wood. We didn't have any gas or, or any electricity. We cooked with wood, and therefore we would gather wood from the forest and bring it in, dry it out, and then use it for cooking. And it was very nice. It's much more purified form of cooking. Srila Prabhupada is on record of saying that cow dung is first class. <laughs> the aroma that comes from cow dung when you cook is also very purifying. And he said second class is wood, third class is gas, fourth class is electricity. It's not even within the classification. Electricity is so bad that you know, people who collect, uh, who cook with electricity sometimes get sick because of that. There was one lady, I had a personal experience with her. Her husband was telling me that she was sick and the doctor told her not to cook on her electric stove because it would make her more sick. <laughs> so this electricity is just, I mean, it has a purpose, but it's not meant for cooking. Yeah. So, yeah, so God has provided so much wood, and of course, when we keep cows, we can use cow dung in a more simplified lifestyle. And also, cow dung can be dried out, and there's a machine that you can get which makes gas from the cow dung. It's called methane gas. You can heat your homes with this methane gas. So all of the heating problems are solved. You don't have to have you pay big heating bills. Because right now, I'm you know I travel around and recently I was in the UK and the heating bills of people in the last couple of years have quadrupled, not just doubled or tripled, quadrupled. And one of my disciples he told me he was at one point he was paying 150 pounds a month for the heating bills during the winter. <coughs> now it's up to 500 pounds a month. <laughs> so, yeah, so all of these things, that means that one has to work very hard for materialistic activity in order to get the money to pay for heating when everything is provided by Krishna through the earth. So Prabhupada wanted us to you know, keep cows. That from, the from the material perspective, cows provide a lot of things. Of course, it provides the miracle food milk. As explained in the Shastras, milk is necessary for finer brain tissues, which nourishes the brain, of course, and that way one can understand more deeper philosophical teachings. Milk actually fertilizes the brains. And Prabhupada said not too much, though. <laughs> he said he gave us a, a formula, uh, one pound of milk per day, and no more than one pound and one half pound. Than that. And he cooled that all milk products. So when I was living in Uberndown, we had we had we had many cows, and so every night we were having these nice big bowls of fresh cow milk, which was so nice you didn't have to put any sugar in it. It was half cream and half milk, very nutritious and satisfying. So yeah, so cow mother, mother cow is she's also known as mother, therefore she should be treated in that way. And um, of course, as Prabhupada mentions here, and in practically every purport of the same nature, he says, if we have sufficient grains, fruits, vegetables, and herbs, then what is the necessity of running slaughterhouses and killing poor animals? Which is very heavy karma within the society. Prabhupada pretty much said many times that probably all, this, all the suffering that people are doing and in, 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 in feeling in society coming from the outside is all due to the slaughter of innocent animals, particularly the cows. Mm -hmm. The Shastras say, Brahma, what is it? Manu Samhita. Manu Samhita is the law books of mankind. Of mankind. And one version of the Manu Samhita says, the killing of a cow is like the killing of two men. It's equal. In the Shastras, it says that five classes, five categories, not classes, five categories of people must receive protection from the ruling society or by their protectors. 
And what are those five classes? Women, children, old people, cows, and brahmanas. These are the five. And then, in that same purport describing these five, it says out of the five, the two most important are the cows and the brahmanas. Because by Brahminical culture, cow protection is actually flourishes. Without Brahminical culture, you have Rakshasha culture, which we have today. <laughs> and therefore, nobody's happy. And then it goes on to explain in that same purport that out of the two, the most important is the cow. I mean, Krishna is called Goloka. And Krishna's planet is called Goloka, the planet of the cows. The highest planet in the spiritual world is named after the cows. <laughs> Krishna is called Gopal. He's the protector of the cows. Govinda, when he gives pleasure to the, to the cows and the senses. So how, how valuable is, are these animals that are produced by... And uh, recently I've been traveling around and pr promoting my book and I've been speaking about the glories of cows. So one day, when I was giving one lecture in America, I think it was in Charlotte, North Carolina, um, one gentleman who lived in India prior to coming here, he was saying, you know, it's interesting because um, many families would have their own personal cow and the cow would provide many of the necessities they needed. And they would take the care of the cow just like a family member. And then he was saying that when someone in the family would get sick, then someone would go over, some family member would go over to the cow and talk to the cow right in their ear and say, and this person is sick with this disease. And the cow would respond by going out and looking for a particular herb that will be the cure of that disease. She would eat that herb and they milk that cow and they would give it to the person who was sick. <laughs> <laughs> and then, after saying that, I mentioned that again in another lecture in another group of people, and one man who also was living in India said, he said, Maharaj, it's not exactly like that. He said, you don't have to tell the cow. She knows who's sick. She goes automatically and finds that, that herb, and then they book the cow and give it to that person. Now, this is amazing. We don't really know the value and the benefit and the glory of cows because we're more engaged with cars instead of cows. <laughs> but cows are just really God's gift to human society. But all the problems in the world is because we're exploiting and not taking advantage of what the cow wants to give by the arrangement of God. That's one of the biggest problems. Therefore, Prabhupada said, keep, uh, start these farms, keep, have cows, produce nice milk. The cow walks on the ground, her hooves food fertilizes the field, and, and then agriculture can grow, simply by the cows walking on the field. And the bull also provides, you know, for moving things around. He's more or less, you're more like a can carry things, move people around also. It's a more simplified lifestyle, so devotees think, well, do we have to go back to that? <laughs> I can't plug in my computer, you know. <laughs> so we're not saying you have to give up all of these uh, amenities, but at least provide for, this, for a lifestyle that is more simple and not so much dependent on this uh, industrial complex, which is just exploiting everyone. The whole basis of Western civilization, capitalism, and other places around the world is to get as much money as they can from the products they produce. Um, and Prabhupada said that this, and this is part, I have it in my book, Prabhupada explains that in 1973, he made a statement, he said in 50 years, in the word 50, this entire Western civilization will collapse, he said. 
50 years is this year. <laughs> it's already starting to collapse. If you will be a little bit observant around the world, if you li listen to the local news, you won't know anything. <laughs> but if you go to a, news sources that are not allowed to be on, they tell you actually what's really happening. And it's a fact, you know. And I'm also experiencing and meeting people who are and people in, in the UK also were standing in food lines to get food. And these were people that were able to provide everything they needed. Now they were out of work and had and didn't have enough money even to provide for food. That's an industri highly industrial company country such as the UK. In the United States it's also things are falling apart economically, politically, socially. The uh, the national debt of the United States of America is 350 trillion. That's the national debt. The, the country's broke. It's finished. But it keeps printing money just so to keep the economy going. So it's a full sense of economy. And eventually, uh, they can only do that for so long before they'll have to you know, switch to another lifestyle or, you know, I don't know, I don't know what the solutions are based on their own particular. But Prabhupada basically said, and, and this, you know, therefore he said build these farms. So this is the future not only of our society but of the world in general. And if you look around the world, do a little research, you'll find a lot of people People who live in the material world, who live in ordinary material life, they're pulling out of society and they're starting their own more simplified lifestyle because they're being pressured by the present society. And Prabhupada saw that that would happen also on a larger scale. So therefore he said, build these and make these farms. And he also said, the basic principle is agriculture. You need food. Grow your own food. Like that. And he said, grow your own food. He said, grow cotton, silk, and make your own clothes. And there's one girl, one of our devotees in Alachua, in America, she's growing cotton. <laughs> right behind our temple in, our, in Alachua, she's got a whole system for growing cotton. <laughs> of course, the environment is conducive because of the climate there. And so that's, that's an example of devotees that are moving in that direction to, write it, to, to provide some more of a simplified lifestyle. The third thing Prabhupada said is learn about herbs and make your own medicines. How much money do we spend on medicines? Oh my God. And then you even don't even know if these medicines are going to be good. Prabhupada said all the cures of any disease is there within nature. You just have to learn how nature has provided. There's one devotee in our movement, his name is Dwibuja, and he runs a herbal business. And he, uh, he lives in New Taliban, which is near, and there's a, it's like a rural community, and there's a lot of forest areas there. So many years ago, I was with him, and he was. Well, we were walking through the forest, and he was showing me the different plants. And he said, "This is good for this. This is good for this. This is." I don't know anything. It all looks to me like just some shrubbery or greenery and all. But each of the uh, each of the plants had their own, you know, quality about it. Many, of course, some don't provide much, but uh, others. If you know how to use it and distract it and make medicines from that, you can make medicines to cure anything. And also preventative medicines. So he has now a business called the Blue Boy Herb Company. <laughs> he calls it Blue Boy. He's also calling, I don't know, call, what was another? Uh, some, uh, he's got two names, one for girl, too. Uh, uh, something girl company too, <laughs> one, one boy, one girl. But he, he provides these tinctures, medicines, both for the devotees, and he franchises it to the outside world also. His name is Dweet Buja. And 
His other devotees are also doing that too in this society because actually all the medicines that are on the market, even the commercial stuff, they take stuff from nature and then they combine it with various other ingredients and make medicines from that. But a lot of the times they put chemicals in there and other things that are not beneficial. So Prabhupada said, learn the whole science of herbology and provide medicines and tinctures, everything you need for preventative and for curative. It's all there in nature. And then the last thing Prabhupada said, build your own houses. <laughs> and uh, when, I, when Prabhupada came to New Vrindavan, because it was a farm community, he said, uh, you know, you should build your own houses. And then we said, well, what kind of house should we build? And Papa said, give me a pencil and paper. And so on the pencil and paper, he drew a structure of a house that would be accommodate a family of four, you know, and a husband, wife, and two children. And we called it the Prabhupada house. <laughs> it was a very simple one. And if you go to New Rajadam in Hungary, you'll see that they build their own houses for the devotees there. Of course, the, but they hire companies outside to do it. But the houses are very simple, and they, they are also sufficient for people to live nicely all year round. They provide everything. And devotees have, you know, the houses right on the land. They don't own them, the community owns them. But you get a house if you decide to be there and engage in devotional service, you have a family. They'll give you a house, and then you agree to do so many hours of devotional service. And if you leave, the house stays. <laughs> but at least you have a nice house while you're there. And it's yours as long as you're there. <laughs> it's a very, what we say, viable program for livelihood and for engaging devotees in a more simplified lifestyle. So, uh, yeah, so Prabhupada talked about that. Therefore, he said in 1977, his last year with us, he said, 50% of my mission is incomplete. I haven't established these farm communities. He said, do, he said, complete this. So he made this emphasis that he wanted our society to come to, if you read, I mean, and there's so many purports, especially in the first canto. It's full. Prabhupada's talking about. I mean, there's another one here. And the just two chapters later in the first canto, tenth chapter, verse number four and five, it's mentioned that during the reign of Maharaj Yudhisthira, the clouds showered all the water that people needed, and the earth produced all the necessities of man and profusion. Due to its fatty milk bag and cheerful attitude, the cow used to moisten the grazing ground with milk. And Prabhupada's first statement, the basic principle of economic development is centered on land and cows. <laughs> the necessities of human society are food grains, fruits, milks, materials, minerals, clothing, wood, etc. One requires all these to fulfill the material needs of the body. Then he goes on to smash the whole Western idea of industrial civilization. Heavy purport. Anyway, really, I'm going to speak about this one in Langenthal tomorrow. <laughs> it's, it's even more heavy. So, um, the Prabhupada, of course, he didn't want the temples in, in the cities to just stop. But he could see that our 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 devotees who were married with families, they had to work for the outside world. And the children were having to go to public schools and learn all kinds of things that are not necessary and also very harmful for them. So he wanted these farm communities with gurukuls where the children could grow up and learn Krishna consciousness along with the basic subject matters that are necessary. And of course, when they get to the level of university, they can go to the colleges and society. But growing children up is also growing the future. So he wanted that as part of these communities also, a place to educate our children. And it's very important. 
because <laughs> I was uh, traveling in America and I was at one of one house of one of my disciples. You know, she's from India and uh, she has two children, one boy, he was 14 years old. So he's going to a local public school. And so I said, what's it like in school? <laughs> Wrong question to ask. <laughs> he said, well, it's hell. <laughs> he said, it's crazy. He said, many of my fellow students, of course they're not his friends, but they're just there, they come in and they they steal the sinks and the toilets from the school and they bring them home. They bring tools into the school and unscrew the school to toilets and the sinks. I thought this is amazing. This is really wild. <laughs> <laughs> and you know they get away with it sometimes. Some sometimes they get caught. <laughs> And just when I went to the United States, just, when was it, beginning of this year, I came to one of my disciples, not my disciples, wasn't my disciple, but a good friend. And he has, you know, he's married with two children. So it was a weekday and the kids were home that day. So I said, why are they not going to school? He said, well actually there was a report and that there was some information and that there was some snipers coming into the school and somebody found out about it, alerted the police and caught these snipers. They were ready to shoot up the school. Another one of these shootings, I don't know if you hear about them, but they go on, okay. And some crazy guy comes in. And that was the same school that these two children who were devotee kids were going to. Fortunately, somebody was able to find out ahead of time and notified the police and then they stopped the whole thing and caught the people that were engaged in that. So it's happening all over the, the world. Maybe Europe is not as bad as the United States. The United States is like a war zone. <laughs> it's really hell, for, especially for children going to school. And uh, so here Prabhupada says, uh, and he also mentions wealth is really cows and land. If you have land, you have something, you have equity. You can do things with land. You can live on it, you can develop it. And you can take care of all of your necessities. And cows also provide everything you need as a supportive feature for, for agriculture and for, and for worship also. And then there's another thing here, Prabhupada mentions in this other purport. When the, when the Lord is obeyed by the king, let me see, oh no, not only do regular rains help produce ample production of grains and fruits, but when they combine with astronomical influences, there is ample production of valuable stones and pearls. For those of you who are not aware, there's a particular constellation called Swati. When Swati is in the, in the heavens or, or in the sky, when that constellation appears, and if it rains at that time, the rain that falls on the head of a snake turns into jewels. The rain that falls on the head of an elephant also turns into gems. And the rain that falls in the oceans turns into pearls and they're taken by oysters. So through rain, actually, uh, valuable mountain minerals come by way of you know, astronomical com com calculations or combinations in rain. This is all part of nature's providing everything people need. Yeah. Yeah. So everything is there by God's arrangement. So in this paper money, now they, uh, they, call, it, they call it money, it's just paper. <laughs> It's valuable because the government says, government says it's so, but what if the government says it's no longer here? Just like I was in India in 19, no, 2000, the end of 2016 and the beginning of 2017. And uh, this, was in, this was around January. And Mr. Modi, the president of India, prime minister of India, decided to pull back two of the 
bills, the 1,000 rupee note and the 500 one? Yeah. And anybody who couldn't prove that they had actually legally earned this money, then, then their money was completely useless. And people were taking their money and they were burning it in piles. We saw that. And they were just throwing it. It was just useless paper. And I'll tell you a little hint, too. This Maybe to cut this out of the tape. Mr. Modi's going to do it again. <laughs> He's got another planet. If you go to India, all of the banks in India now are collecting all of the 2,000 notes and they're taking them out of circulation. So eventually he's gonna pull back the 2,000 note also. That's coming up. So yeah, that's all, he's doing that to stop all the black market because people, when they, when they wanna make money, they counterfeit the biggest bills. Mm -hmm. There's a large amount of you know, illegal activity that goes on, in, especially in India, printing money. <laughs> so that was an example of how this paper money is useless. <laughs> it's just, and Prabhupada also said, it'll be useless, you can stuff your pillow with it after some time. <laughs> <laughs> For now, it has some value. So if, you're gonna, if you have it, use it for what you need. Don't just keep it in the bank. <laughs> you might wind up losing it in due course of time. So, yeah, Prabhupada's using, he said, buy land. So he wanted us to have some nice land that devotees could use to live and develop Krishna consciousness on these farms. So that's, that's what's called the unfinished business of Prabhupada's mission in establishing Krishna consciousness, a more of a simplified lifestyle. And even some of the city temples now are starting to recognize that, you know, the food on the markets are not good. So in places in America and other places, devotees are growing their own foods right in, food right in the temples with greenhouses in the cities too. And this is more of a compromised way of doing it, but still provides food anyway. And inflation and scarcity are on the rise everywhere in the world. So, Anyway, I'm not a doomsday prophet. <laughs> I don't want to be known as one. <laughs> I simply want to try to emphasize the importance of Prabhupada's mission in a more simplified lifestyle because he emphasized that. There are hundreds of statements by Srila Prabhupada about the importance of this, this type of lifestyle and how we, in, in my book, there's a QR code. You know what a QR code is? You scan your phone, and you can, you scan your phone on that QR code, you can hear Prabhupada's talking. And he said in 50 years this whole thing will be finished. It's on that, in that QR code. But he also, devotees are talking, and Prabhupada's talking about all the problems in the world is due to all of these uh, rascal scientists, he said. <laughs> And uh, so one devotee was saying, yeah, Prabhupada, we've had all these problems since time of memorial. Prabhupada said, no, not time of memorial. Just the last 200, 250, 300 years, these rascal scientists come out and have destroyed everybody's life. <laughs> he didn't say, he said, not from time of memorial. Only the last 250, 300 years, he said. I could talk about scientists too, but you know, then I might get, you know, kicked off YouTube. So I have to be careful. <laughs> I already had two warnings from YouTube, and they said one more and you're out. <laughs> so, yeah, because again, you know, I've been speaking about this and everywhere because it's revolutionary. It's challenging Western society. And other things that I've also said, which I won't mention. <laughs> I think you know, the, uh, you know, Krishna Prima Reva Rupa knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> so yeah, so Prabhupada's program for, for proliferation of Krishna consciousness 
was to more or less move back to a more simplified lifestyle. And it also brings the devotees together, and it's more of an ideal environment for worship and for practice of Krishna consciousness. You can still have you know, what we say modern amenities to some degree, but a lot of it will be, you know, will seem to be unnecessary. And just like some of our devotees now, they keep cows, have milk, they're making cheese from it, first class butter, everything from our cows from certain places around the world. Especially where I stay in Croatia and Slovenia. We have a few devotees that are doing that. And uh, they give me this milk and cheese, it's like, wow. So tasty and so sweet and natural. The cheese is all it is, is just milk turned. It's, there's no chemicals, no pesticides. So health is a very big important part of life. And uh, if we're living in a way that our health is being impinged upon because of necessities we need coming from the Western materialistic exploitive society, then obviously there has to be some change like that. There's a statistic that's out. This is a whole different subject. That... Um, I don't want to go into it, it's really heavy. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> In other words, when you get sick, everything you need to find a cure is there in nature. If we can learn that and to have our own kavirajas, our own devotees who can do that, how to minister that, you don't have to go to doctors. Because people who go to doctors actually get killed by the cure that the doctor gives them. This is a statistic. It's on film. 15,000 people every month in the United States die because of the cure they go for treatment. And this is not some, you know, conspiracy theory. This is coming by the Food and Drug Administration and the CDC, which is the, in the uh, Committee for Defense, what is it? CDC is Center for Disease Control. And when the two, two prominent agencies have made this statement to the public that people are dying from the cure. <laughs> you pay money, you get some kind of medical insurance, you go to the doctor and he kills you. <laughs> Well, 15,000 people a month. And this is given by a prominent doctor who's done all the research and shown this and brought up all these statistics. It's not some, some crazy guy trying to, you know, create a revolution. It's just some mainstream. So yeah, so uh, we need to move a little bit away from being dependent on this Western society, which Prabhupada said is soul killing, and become more de dependent on Krishna, on nature for whatever we need, and create a lifestyle that is conducive to that. Especially, particularly for those who live in Grihastha life. But then you, people say, well, boy, that's a really hard transition to make. How can I give up my car, my cell phone? You don't have to give up these things. You just you have to just take, live in a more natural environment where whatever you need is automatically provided. And if you need some you know, modern amenities, these things can also be there to some degree. Just like now they're experimenting with this 5G. You know, 5G. Your phones, your computers, internet. So before, first it was 2G, then 3G, then 4G, and now 5G. 5G has been proven to be, just like one devotee was telling me, they set up a 5G tower right next to his, my, next to his apartment building. Everybody in the apartment building got sick after a few months of that 
And somebody was telling me about their, their experiment with 6G now. And when they do the experiment, the birds actually go crazy. It actually causes the birds to go crazy in their flight. And, and a couple of species of birds have become destroyed simply by 5G. So they're killing everybody. <laughs> it's just the way it is through this, this, uh, this developed society. You know, just being exposed to the EMF is heavy, you know. You get headaches. People get brain damages from the fusing their cell phones. It's just, statistics are high in many areas of the world. Even in India, it's one of the highest places. People use cell phones all the time. I mean, I'm not against cell phones because they have a use, but people find that they can't even live without their cell phone. Have you ever seen people with their cell phone? It's like, it's a marriage. <laughs> I went to one university in uh, Boston, and it was North Eastern University. So we did a program, and the devotees had organized it, and many of the students that came were from India. And so we were talking about the, the problems and the dangers of cell phones. That was our topic. <laughs> and so at the end of the class, one young man, Indian nationality, he was so distraught, he came up to me. He said, hey, Swamiji, you know, if I don't have my cell phone for six minutes, I go crazy. Six minutes. Six minutes, that's the exact word he said. So, yeah, so these are some of the things that we've been subjected to by our modern industrial society. Uh, people are really getting sick. Everybody is sick now. You just find it. There's only so many problems because of the food, because of the environment. And Switzerland is a little bit better. And it actually has a little bit more of a pure atmosphere because of the mountains. The mountains really are, they clean the atmosphere really nicely and provide a nice, you know, fresh air and environment is nice because of the mountains. But in many places around the world, it's hell. <laughs> really hell. Anyway, I could give this class for another two hours, but I, <laughs> but I don't want to burn you down with all of the wrong things that are going on. <laughs> but what the point is to look very seriously and experiment with and try to get a little experience of what it's like to live in a more simplified atmosphere because we might find ourselves, and Prabhupada did say that, we might find ourselves forced to go back there as Western society becomes more and more destructive. Uh, unfortunately, as a society, we're not developing these programs fast enough. There's not enough emphasis on that. Shiva Ram made that, Shiva Ram Maharaj has made that point many times in his lectures. We're not putting that as a priority in our, in our mission in Krishna consciousness. And it's important because it's, it'll stabilize the entire society. And then we can have classes that teach people what is Brahminical life, how to govern, how to rule, Kshatriya, all, all the information is there in Shastra. We just have to teach it. How to take care of cows, grow food, and do banking, commerce. Uh, everything is there. God has provided everything. And so, uh, yeah. Okay, so I'll stop there. Any questions, comments, requests for redrawals of certain statements? <laughs> you mentioned that the real wealth is land and cows. Right, right that's what, yeah, yeah. Not the paper one. Um, what about um, 
like gold. Gold, yeah. Yes. Precious metals, yeah. Also, no? because yeah. sometimes the gold is argued, but no, Kali is interested to the gold, so you shouldn't get gold, but actually it's, it's a metal that is always yeah. relevant. Gold, silver, uh, platinum, rubies, various types of precious metals, that's also wealth. That's provided by the earth also. It will always kind of be stable. Yeah. And that'll, that, that'll always have value, no matter what, what happens on the economic and political scene. These metals will always be used as used for purchasing, for trading, like that. What Jewelry. About, what about the Kali effect, that Kali and this gold? That hmm? Some people said they would argue about Kali and this gold, and that's why. Wherever gold was hoarded, hmm. mentions that it, when Kali was chastised by Maharaj Pariksit, he told them, you can only stay where these four sinful activities were, illicit sex, intoxication, gambling, and media. Kali said, when your kingdom is nowhere to be found, you still have to give me a place to go. I'm also your progeny. So, and he, then Maharaj Prabhupada said, wherever gold is hoarded. Mm. For selfish purposes. Yes, yeah. yeah. But if the gold is keeping a Christian right. service, it's different. Yeah. Yeah, it would be good. Just recently, um, they found tons of gold in one place in the world that was being hoarded. 500 tons of raw bullion gold. I won't mention where they found it. If you want to know, you can ask me. <laughs> you can ask me personally. It was, under, it was underground. It was kept under the ground. So, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, this. Uh, you can't buy gold now. I mean, you can, but maybe a gold chain here and there, a gold ring here and there. But, but actual gold bullion is being taken and just hoarded. And the price of gold is just rising, something like $2,000 an ounce now. Years ago, I remember when I was young, it was $50 an ounce, now it's $2,000 an ounce. The silver market has also been captured. You can't even buy silver either. So all of these these people who have big positions or powerful persons, they you know, they've used their money to get all of this because they know it's valuable. And you see, you see stores now. We buy gold, right? So they want you to you know cash in your gold and they give you this paper. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen the money in, in the, the UK now? It's plastic. Yeah. So they take paper and they put a plastic over it. You can't even hold it. It slips out of your hand. It's just so slippery. <laughs> it's all plastic now. <laughs> it's not even paper anymore. <laughs> and the latest thing is, the biggest problem now is climate change. And guess what they're doing? They're blaming climate change on, on the presence of cows. And there's a center of the society there saying, because of animals, especially cows, that is the problem with climate change. So they're killing cows based on that. Yeah, this is going on. You don't hear this, and you won't catch it on the news because, you know, that's not allowed. So yeah. Remember, Ahmad Prabhupada said, yeah, develop these communities and we can sustain our Krishna conscious lifestyle through these more simplified lifestyles. We still, we still have our temples. We didn't, he didn't say close the temples. He said just have, have a farm community for every temple in the ISKCON and that farm can provide everything the temple needs. It was a GBC resolution, and back in 2018, I think it was, that they said that every temple in ISKCON should have a program to supply milk for the deities by the year 2022 Janmashtami. 
there was a resolution that you have to have a program in order to and so they were seeing that and then my god sister she also wrote a book called bhakti milk which is one step up higher than a hemsa milk bhakti milk is milk that comes from our farms krishna conscious farms so this hemsa milk is not really ideal because many of the times that they raise cows when the cow no longer can give milk, they send they sell it to the slaughterhouses. If you want, I can give a whole class on cows. <laughs> because cows are really interesting. There's so much we can say about the beauty of cows. And you'll find a lot of these statements scattered throughout the Shastras. Okay, so I don't want to keep you too late. I'm sure you have other activities. Anything, any last comments or anything? Um, I was wondering how you would explain the how can we live simply in this city? Is it possible? Up to a certain point, but then you depend on, you need you need electricity, you need gas, you need all of these things that are provided by the society. So therefore you have to you have to make money or you have to get money somehow in order to, to keep these temples going. And a lot of energy and time and effort is to get. So living simply is very hard because then you're forced by the present situation to uh, take time and energy to gather and get money. So of course we get money by book distribution, we get money by donations. And that's fine, that's good. Living simply in the temple means if you're living in the temple, you're already living simply. <laughs> <laughs> right? In that sense, you're you know, you're not you're not and not outside working for, you know, Western civilization yeah so uh, simplicity is both a lifestyle and is in a state of consciousness also and the state of consciousness is is based on that verse that uh, is mentioned by Sri Upanishad Ishavashamidam Sarvam that everything animate and inanimate is owned and controlled by the law by the by the Supreme Lord. And one should live in such a way that they live according to their quota. So live according to your needs, that's all. That's simple living. Not that we have to have like the latest computer, and the latest wristwatch, the latest cell phone, the latest of everything. It's not that we have to have so many material items. In a community type lifestyle and also in a temple lifestyle, things can be shared rather than owned on a personal level. And that's where community because you can't create these farm situations without developing community. Community means everyone works for the whole of the community and resources and labor are shared by everyone. Everyone has a particular duty and service and they provide for the benefit of everyone else through their own service. And the resources that we get from the labor, and that, can be, and that means food, clothing and whatever else we need. So, when I was living in New Vrindavan, <laughs> it was really simple. You know, nobody, they never, we never had any clothing. <laughs> if you wanted some clothing, there was a, we had an old unused barn. And anybody who would leave the community after being there, we told them, can you leave some of your clothing behind you? So if you needed some clothes, you'd go out there and look for something that was thrown out in the barn. Yeah, that's how we did it. And everybody had these big rubber boots. That's all we had was these, they went up to our knees. And 
because uh, <laughs> we had a lot of mud. <laughs> and the mud was everywhere, especially in the, in the winter time. And well, many times around the year there was mud. And you could only get boots if you made a request. You had to fill out a requisition form, give it to the leaders. And then they would buy the boots for you. But usually it took a month to get them after you filled.